Thank you all for coming tonight to the Third Hampshire Candidates Forum. I'm Laura Sylvester from the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts, and we are excited to have candidates here and be able to ask them questions about issues that are of importance to us. Um, just a few housekeeping notes. If you have a cell phone on you, please silence it, silence it or turn it off so that we don't hear it um, beeping during the uh, forum. Um, there are two sets of bathrooms. There's bathrooms downstairs and bathrooms upstairs. Uh, we're very grateful to the Bank Center for letting us use their space. We're also uh, happy to be co-sponsoring this event with CESA, the Community Involved in Sustaining Agriculture. And also thank you to Amherst Media for filming this. You will be able to watch this forum online um, on their website, which is amherstmedia.org. So Eric Nakajima and Mindy Donnell face off in the Democratic primary election. Uh, the primary election is Tuesday, September 4th, which is the day after Labor Day. And since there are no Republicans running in this race, and incumbent uh, Representative Solomon Goldstein Rose is not seeking re-election, the primary will determine who will represent the district at the State House. Um, the general election is Tuesday, November 6th, so please mark your calendars for both of those elections. I'd like to also thank our timekeepers, Michelle from the Food Bank, my colleague, and Noah from CESA, they're in the front row. Um, thank you to uh, Stephanie, who's also from the Food Bank, she's back there. She's going to be roaming around collecting your questions. Um, so when you have a question written on a card, the third round tonight is, is going to be for audience questions, so please do ask a question and hold up your card and Stephanie will come and collect it. I um, also want to thank Mass Voters Choice and Better Angels for tabling. And finally, I want to say a special thank you to our moderator, Keith Barnacle. Um, for the past 11 years, Keith has worked as a district aide for two of the most progressive members of the U.S. House of Representatives, Congressman John Olver, and um, House member of the House Appropriations Committee and ranking member of the Appropriations Subcommittee for Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development, uh, and Congressman James P. McGovern, ranking member of the powerful House Rules Committee and House Committee on Agriculture. Keith is originally from the Blackstone Valley out in Central Mass and has called Pioneer Valley here home for over 20 years. Keith lives and works in Northampton, Massachusetts, and he's going to explain the order of events, how the questions will work, etc. So without further ado, please welcome Keith Barnacle. Thank you, Laura. Um, I just want to just take a moment to thank the Banks Community Center for hosting this, for the Food Bank for putting this together, and our two, two candidates who are here tonight, Eric Nakajima and Mindy Do, who are hurtling towards the state primary in a couple weeks from tomorrow. So um, all the best. So I'm going to um, just take a couple minutes here to go through um, go through some of the um, introductions here uh, before we get started. And I'd like to first again start by saying hello and welcome. Uh, I'd like it's nice to see a good decent crowd here tonight uh, in the kind of dog days of summer and uh, people are getting involved and engaged in this election, which is important um, as we really have a major, major shift uh, across the Pioneer Valley with regards to our uh, state elected officials. So. Um, I'm going to go over some of the, the details for the, uh, the forum tonight, and um, first we're going to have three rounds, of, uh, or, or we're going to have total three rounds of questions tonight. Round one will consist of seven questions. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to answer. We're going to flip a coin to determine who starts, and then have them alternate who answers first in subsequent rounds. So whoever starts in the beginning, the, the, the other candidate will start the next round. Um, we have timekeepers in the front row who will let you know when you have 30 seconds left. This is for the candidates. When you have 30 seconds left for answering, and we'll hold up a red stop sign uh, when the time is up. Please, uh, please stop and, and take a moment to wrap up your thoughts as soon as you see that stop sign. Um, also, please, candidates, feel free to not take the full 90 seconds. If you said what you need to say in less than 90, I know it's hard for politicians or candidates running for office, but. Um, if you said what you need to say uh, in less time, please feel free to do so. Um, round two will be our lightning hot topic round, using the 12 categories on the wheel. The wheel you'll find uh, centrally oriented here in the uh, up front. And um, each candidate will spin the wheel and have 60 seconds to talk about whatever category it lands on. Uh, we'll do this three times. If a candidate gets the same topic as they did before, <laughs> they can spin again for a new topic. Did the lights just go on? Yeah. Yes. 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 Yes.
Um, round three will be questions from the audience. Uh, we'll be collecting your questions during the hot topic round, and we'll choose seven. Like the first round, each candidate will have 90 seconds to answer. Um, following that round, we'll have a, a brief closing remarks from the candidates, and we'll send you off into the night knowing a little bit more about your two choices for state rep in this district. Um, before we get to questions, each candidate will have uh, one minute to make their opening remarks. And right now, I'm going to flip a coin to determine that order. Um, so who wants to call it? Heads. 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 Okay, so I guess that's me. So that means, yeah, or do, or do you get to choose which one you want? I'll spin the wheel. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to start with over there. Okay, uh, thank you. Want to go? Yes. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, so thank you very much, uh, the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts, uh, to Keith, to Cease, and for everyone for coming tonight. Uh, I have been really enjoying the campaign, getting out, meeting people, listening to you. And uh, out of that, it's really reinforced a lot of the things I've gotten to learn being on the school committee and uh, the work I did prior to that, uh, working for Governor Patrick. Um, losing our rep entire legislative delegation out here, particularly the Senate President and uh, Representative Kulik, who is our uh, Vice Chair of Ways and Means, is a huge gap to fill. And that's occurring in a time where we, frankly, are uh, backsliding in terms of support for public education, public transit, and other critical needs in our region. I'm running and excited to run because I think we need to change direction and I want to bring all of my experience to bear serving this district and working with you uh, to move the state in a more progressive direction, but also to make sure that the needs of our district are well met. Thanks, Eric. Good evening, everybody. Thank you to the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts and to CESA for organizing tonight and for sponsoring it, to Banks for hosting it, to Amherst Media for televising it, for everybody for coming out and being engaged in a campaign when, in a really hot, wet summer. Until five years ago, I spent most of my life working in the HIV epidemic as a program planner, a congressional aide, an activist, an advocate, and a coalition builder. And for me, working in the epidemic was more than just talking to people about retrovirus and how our immune systems work. It was about how we care for one another as a community. And that's what I want to bring to the State House. I want to bring that sense of compassion and caring. I also want to suggest tonight that we shift our thinking around safety net issues and that we start to not think of services that provide access to housing, food, health, education, and a secure retirement as safety net, but rather we consider them to be essential services and essential supports. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna move right on to the first round of questions. And um, I, this, uh, this first round will last 21 minutes, and I have uh, seven prepared uh, questions to be asked during this round. Candidates will each have 90 seconds to answer. Um, whoever went oh, and second in the opening statements will answer first in this round. So that would be you, Mindy, okay? So I'm going to start with these questions. And if you need anything repeated or, or clarified, just let me know or to go slower. First question. The Healthy Incentives Program, or HIP, allows SNAP recipients to maximize their benefits by offering a dollar-for-dollar -dollar reimbursement to participants that purchase fruits and vegetables at farmers markets, CSAs, farm stands, and mobile markets. In its first 15 months, HIP has provided access to locally, locally grown produce for 40,000 households. However, those 40,000 households represent only 7% of all SNAP recipient households in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And even with the slightly increased funding for FY19, uh, uh, HIP will likely, again, run out of funding before the end of the fiscal year. What would you do to secure the sustainability of the HIP program? I am really going to fight like heck to make sure that the HIP program not only gets um, funded at the same level, but increased. This particular program is so interesting to me. Because when it first started, it actually had a very bad rollout. The machines weren't all there at the same time. We scrambled to make sure that people knew about the program. And still, even with a bad rollout, it blew through with the money before the first fiscal year was over. That's how much people love this program. It's, not, it's a win-win-win-win program. 
It's good for farmers because it has SNAP recipients spending their SNAP dollars on local produce, either at farm stands or at farmers markets or in CSA shares. So it's good for the economy. It's good for families because they get access to produce and they also get extra funds to be able to buy even more food. But I'm also a fan of one particular element of this program. I think it dispels the myth that low-income people don't know how to eat healthy. Um, for, you know, across the board, we're always kind of hearing about how we have to teach people how to eat healthy. We have to teach people about the benefits of produce. And actually, that may not be the case. It may just be the case that produce is extremely expensive. And when we give folks the resources to be able to purchase the fresh produce, they do it and they do it in large numbers. So I'm a big advocate for this program. I'm looking forward to expanding it and making Massachusetts a leader in it in the country. Thanks, Mindy. Thank you. The, uh, the HIP program is a tremendous success story and something that is, is really remarkable in terms of supporting uh, farmers in our region as well as families throughout our region throughout our state. Uh, it really is, as many just said, a win-win-win program. And I was deeply disappointed that the legislature uh, didn't fully fund the program at the end of the session. Uh, it's hard to imagine why when this is something that has such extensive benefits throughout our region and state. What I would like to do is, when I'm elected is to fight for increased funding in a supplemental budget, which um, every year when the legislature is doing their budget and they always pass a budget uh, at, the end of, uh, at the end of June or the middle of July like this year, and then mid-year, they'll pass a supplemental budget. I want to fight to make sure we expand funding in that supplemental budget to make sure we can meet the needs of all the families who are participating in the program. Okay, great, thank you. I'm going to move on to question number two. Um, Eric will take the first uh, shot. Um, an, an increasing number of senior citizens are being pushed into poverty as rents increase from the market forces, from market forces and inflation. As a new state representative, what concrete steps will you take to increase housing protections for older Massachusetts residents who are at risk of homelessness and food insecurity from rents and other expenses that consume too much of a very fixed income? This is really an increasing problem and, and a dramatic and striking one. I don't know if people had a chance to see uh, in the Daily Hampshire Gazette this today, and then in the last week or two, there's been stories about how um, an analysis of the number of foreclosures and bankruptcies uh, among senior citizens has doubled over the last 20 years. So if it's a lived experience that you know from talking to your neighbors and other folks who are stressed out by their housing expenses and food costs and prescription costs, uh, it's also something that's been well documented. This is an, a national epidemic that goes back to uh, the decline in uh, defined benefit pensions, uh, as well as insufficient increase in the, the value of uh, uh, people's social security benefits. So it's not, so I think we, what we need to do is a few things. I mean, one, we need to um, advocate for full funding of the programs like uh, Meals on Wheels. Things like actually HIP would also help um, in getting access to healthy food. Um, we also, I think, I support uh, doing a uh, property tax uh, circuit breaker for seniors, in which is a program, a bill right now before the legislature that would exempt seniors of moderate and low income from property taxes over uh, uh, in, if, if, if their income is below a certain level. And I would support doing that as well. I think it's one of the reasons why, particularly in our region, we also need to rebalance um, state support for uh, our municipal budgets because our property taxes in our communities in particular are way too high. It's a lot of stress on seniors. So in Massachusetts, um, I think we rank something like second in, from the bottom in economic security for elders. I think we're above Mississippi. That's not really good. So hearing about the housing situation and how it compounds that is definitely a reality for many seniors. Food insecurity is also a reality. And what I found in my work at the Amherst Survival Center is that seniors also face unique stigma in reaching out for services and in accessing services, whether it's their background, their age around the you know, surviving the depression and using government-funded services, or whether or not other people are in fact connected to them and are able to witness some of their um, burdens and their struggles. We have to do more to incentivize with tax breaks, tax incentives um, that go directly to developers to develop more affordable housing for seniors. This afternoon I was happening to be at Clark House over this way 
And the seniors who live there were talking about the seniors they know not being able to get into affordable housing. So this is a reality for people who are living in this district, and we need to do better. As housing develops, we need to look not only for deeply affordable units for everybody, but maybe we need to start looking at deeply affordable units for seniors. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> right on to question number three. This is going to be the uh, uh, first for a mini state. Uh, many Western Massachusetts residents struggle both to find employment and to find employment that pays a living wage. Do you think the upcoming minimum wage increase to $15 over the next five years will solve this problem or exacerbate it? What do you think the challenges are going to be in implementing it and how would you address them? Um, can you just repeat the first part? I'm sorry. Yes. Um, do you think the minimum wage, do you think the upcoming minimum wage increase to $15 an hour over the next five years will solve this problem or exacerbate it? About finding good jobs? Is that yep, right? and the problem is uh, Massachusetts residents struggling to find jobs and find jobs that pay a living wage. Well, the main problem is that jobs don't pay a living wage. And so we have to figure out a way to make sure that that works and that the, um, the unintended consequences are addressed. That's the first thing. We can't expect businesses to succeed on the backs of poor people. It's just, that's not one. We have to recognize that a minimum wage has to actually be a living wage. $15 in Massachusetts may not even be enough. Um, reports show that, in fact, in order to pay for your bills, whether it be groceries, rent, fuel, in Massachusetts, depending on which part of the state you're in, that minimum wage maybe should be between $17 and $24 an hour. So 15 is just the first step. But I do understand that there are some significant consequences that can happen, especially for small businesses and potentially nonprofits. And so what I would like to see happen on the state level is I'd like us to RFP and send out a proposal to the great minds in, in Massachusetts and do a study on what exactly are going to be the impacts of a $15 minimum wage and higher for small businesses and nonprofits with specific remedies that the state can take to be able to fill that gap. Because we can't expect poor people to continue to work for less than a living wage because it's difficult to figure out how to allow people to be on a living wage. The lack of a living wage means that people have to make impossible trade-offs every day between eating dinner, diapering their babies, paying rent, getting medication. That's not fair in the Commonwealth. So uh, I think that I think the uh, the so-called grand bargain that created paid family medical leave uh, and a fifteen dollar minimum wage uh, that was passed by the legislature this year is a decent start compared to nothing. I mean, the big dare was going to be uh, this summer was going to be if uh, the fifteen dollar minimum wage that was going to be on the ballot had gone to the ballot, but also there was going to be a rollback in the sales tax, which was going to blow a hole in the side of our state budget. It was really going to be a serious problem, but. Um, it is true, a $15 minimum wage is not a living wage for our area. Our area would be around $17 for this region. Um, it's also not indexed for inflation, which is a significant problem. It doesn't do anything to solve uh, the tip minimum wage. Uh, it also eliminates uh, paid time and a half on Sundays and holidays, which if you're, if you're a worker who's making minimum wage, you're already incorporating into your livelihood your ability to make ends meet uh, each week and each month the ability to get paid time and a half on Sundays and holidays. So that's a huge loss, actually, and a huge loss that is not actually fully made up by the increase to $15. Also, there are categories of workers that have been exempt, uh, like municipal workers, some child care workers have been exempt as well. I think that's actually unconscionable. I think we should, we should be including, uh, we raise the eliminated tip minimum wage and have it be $15 an hour for everyone, index it, fight to bring it to a higher level, uh, in general, and also look at the impact on workers. I think it's really a problem. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> moving on to question number four. Uh, social det determinants of health include conditions like socioeconomic status, race, and gender. These and other social de uh, determinants play a role in issues like affordable housing, nutrition, and health care. What would you do as a legislator to create policies and practices that promote equity where there are disparities? So one of the things that I was most excited about in the work I did with Governor Patrick, particularly in his first term, uh, is I was the an innovation advisor, which can mean everything and nothing. 
But essentially what it means is I was seconded to places where you'd bring together teams of people to think across departmental lines to solve complicated problems and challenges. And the, and the most fun work I did was with the Department of Housing and Community Development, and in particular the, uh, the, public, uh, the public housing unit, in which the folks who were working there were really wonderful colleagues, really just terrific and creative folks, were thinking about ways of bringing together uh, education, healthcare services, counseling and support services, uh, and do it in an integrative way in a community-based setting. Actually, something that I've heard many talk about before about um, the ambitions and the reality of the survival center about not looking at your organization as a service entity, but looking at it as, in fact, what it really is, is actual living, breathing part of your community uh, with members and families in your community. And that's what, we, that's what we started the launch in our public housing division. It's something that we also did in our Gateway Cities initiative. So one of the things that I would look to do as a legislature, legislator is to uh, develop, continue to do grant and seed programs to uh, incent collaboration that looks at holistically communities and supporting across agencies, um, community-based settings and support that uh, really touch every facet of an individual's life. I think it's also important when we're developing strategies around community development and support that we, that we look at all the elements, transportation, housing, uh, access to education and other services in an integrative and holistic way. So um, these discussions are interesting because we're, we're adding on to what each other is saying. I think I would also approach it as um, really looking to support the Department of Public Health in Massachusetts. They have a long track record of addressing social determinants of health in very effective ways and in bringing people to um, lots of different kinds of folks who are affected by different issues to a single table to discuss not only the needs and the challenges, but what kind of policies are going to address those. And they often, as a department, get slashed. We look at it as a, a second tier department, and I would probably look to be able to foster that. I'd want to make sure there were enough resources in the Office of Health Equity so that they could be a resource for the Department of Public Health Services, whether it's the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services, or the HIV AIDS office. But I just want to also take that what the word is RIP, right? Because it was from the wheel, in terms of public transportation. Because when we think about social determinants of health, particularly in an area like ours, one huge social determinant is people's lack of transportation in terms of being able to get to hospitals, getting to medical appointments, getting to be able to go to jobs. And so we really need to see that when it's a healthcare issue, it also means expanding bus routes for this region. We need more public transit, and we need more public transit that places doctor's offices and hospitals on those routes so that people can make their appointments, they're not late, they won't, they'll will they be seen by who, the provider that needs to see them, and they can access that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're gonna move on to question five. Um, there are already programs implemented to address food insecurity in the district, in the region, and in the state uh, overall. What's working well? What's not? What would you do to fix or improve programs to make that better? And um, you know, let me just add here: we have a you know we have a congressman who is one of the national leaders on this level. Um, so I you know I'd be curious to hear some of the, some of the ways that this could be moved on the state level. Is it me? Yeah. Um, so what's working well? This is sort of, this is a hard question for me to answer objectively. I'm, so by day, my day job is I'm the executive director of the Amherst Survival Center, and I think our programs work pretty well. Um, so I think that for the most part, food pantries and access to fresh produce is working pretty well. Um, the food bank is a great partner in that regard, and in fact, one of the new programs that was started in Amherst this past year is a mobile food pantry in South Point, um, where the Amherst Survival Center partners with the food bank and our our part is really to provide all the volunteers and the publicity and the outreach. And the food bank comes once a month with a big truck full of lots of fresh produce. Um, and people walk away with about 30 pounds of food um, in their, from their parking lot, walking directly to their apartments. That's a fantastic program, right? It's right in their back door. Um, I think that when we, one of the things that we have to think about with food programs is that there's a difference between access and utilization. So people may have access to programs, but we have to think about why are they using them programs. And I'd like to see more effort um, reviewing why different populations struggle with the uses. What kind of stigma are people facing? 
Um, is it language stigma? Is it transportation, lack of transportation? Why do some folks who obviously need food don't come forward for food? Um, and examining that usage issue and that utilization issue will allow us to reach more people. So there are a lot of really uh, exciting and innovative things going on to help reduce food insecurity in the area. And it's one of, it's one of the things I think is really uh, rewarding about living in this area. I mean, if you look at uh, the Amherst Survival Center's work and the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts work, uh, the uh, things like Not Bread Alone in our, in our community here, but also new programs like uh, the Baby Burke Truck that UMass has had this summer where they have a grant where they're driving around and, and offering uh, lunches. Uh, to uh, to youth, uh, the uh, our our public school system also has uh, a summer food program uh, for youth. So I think there are a number of really creative things. HIP itself, which as we talked earlier in an earlier question, has been uh, heavily utilized in area and fully exhausted its funding. So I think to me, uh, the creativity on the ground uh, in our area and the quality of execution of the programs are outstanding. Uh, the question is how we can make sure that we have even more resources uh, to, to support these programs. So we talked about expanding support for HIP earlier. We also talked about uh, ex expanding the utilization of SNAP by better integrating access uh, to sign up. If you sign up for Mass Health or other programs, improving the ability to gain access to SNAP benefits. So if we could close what's called the SNAP gap, get more people enrolled, then there are more people who could be able to utilize um, food benefits. Uh, and I also think we should look at where we have of food deserts and think about ways of improving access to food. Thank you. Uh, we move on to the sixth question in this round. Um, Massachusetts is one of only 10 states in the United States that has a full-time legislature. Each legislative session is two years long. At the beginning of each session, many thousands of bills are proposed, and by the end of the session two years later, only a relative handful have passed. It's just like Congress. Um, <laughs> according, to, uh, according to the New England Center for Investigative Reporting, Massachusetts passes fewer bills than any other state except for New York, New Jersey, and Minnesota. In 2011, 17,600 bills were proposed. By the end of the session two years later, only 945 had been enacted. That's just 5%. What are your thoughts on this slow process, and what, if anything, do you think can be done to remedy it? Small, small question. Big <laughs> um, I've, I've been involved up on Beacon Hill for years, and uh, for that reason, because you're, you're keenly, when, if you're working for administration, you know, you help draft legislation, you're keenly interested in what the budgetary level is for line items. Um, sometimes they're things that you're involved in directly, other times it's not, just things your colleagues are working on, where you care about it and you know it's a program that's making a difference. And one of the most frustrating things every year, uh, every session I should say, is this race to the end of the session, where they're trying to pass everything they can, it's, you know, it's July, they're up till midnight, uh, and, uh, and sometimes bills die because they, people want them to die, they essentially die in darkness. Uh, other times they die simply because they ran out of time to negotiate and compromise. And I honestly think it's ridiculous. I think it's also uh, profoundly problematic because you don't have appropriate hearings uh, fought fully on bills. People don't always know what's being debated. Um, issues that are really critically important, like in this, this session, we didn't get enough work done on clean energy, like lifting a cap and net metering, uh, or finally uh, getting on a track to fully funding education. Um, what it, honestly, there needs to be a bit of a revolution in the House, and if you say it can't happen because it hasn't happened recently, but if you go back, you know, 30 years ago or something, or 35 years ago, um, there was actually a revolution in the House, and like with the Senate, what Stan Rosenberg did, where the Senate president profound, you know, democratized the organization of committees, they did that back in the House back probably 25 or 30 years ago. I think the House, there needs to be pressure from new legislators like one of us to push that. Stop talking, I'm sorry. I completely agree with this. That it, I actually think that the problem comes back to a lack of transparency in the House. Um, because not only are committees not publicized, agendas aren't publicized, votes aren't publicized, and that locks voters and constituents out so that there's no consistent pressure from voters as to what's going on because people don't know what's going on. So one of the things that I'm gonna hopefully do if elected um, is I think that pressure has to start with the elected officials. 
And this is one of the ways that I think coming in as a block with new representatives from this region is to our advantage. I believe there's some, like, there's a little superpower of being a newbie on the block. And you get to not only watch and learn, but you get to ask questions that maybe more long-term people can't ask. Um, because you're not afraid necessarily of looking like you don't know because you don't know, you're new. Um, and so you can set sort of a high standard. But I also think um, that as an elected official, I'm going to do my best to publicize everything that isn't being publicized to the district and publicly. And hopefully other elected officials will follow my lead. So if I'm invited to committees and with agendas, I'm going to publish that on a website and on social media. I'm going to publish my votes. I'm going to try to get the Gazette to publish votes for the whole region on a weekly basis. And hopefully other elected officials will do it. And that kind of pressure coming from the outside, not from the top down, literally from the bottom up in the legislature, I think will open it up a little bit more. And that will allow voters and residents to exercise a little bit more authority and influence over elected officials to move legislation. It's ridiculous that it's a year-round um, position but they really only do business for a couple of months. Thank you. Um, moving on to question seven, which is the last question in this round, uh, and one of my favorites. If you are elected, what committee post would you request and why? Um, so there's a couple that I'm thinking about. I had heard that Speaker DeLeo had set up a committee likely after the Women's March to uh, monitor the impact of the Trump administration's policies on the state. Nothing's happened in that committee. He packed it with committee chairmen, and maybe that's why nothing happened, because they were busy. So I'm hoping to go and say, let's resurrect that committee, because I'd like to be on that committee. So that's one committee. I'd like to choose higher education. Coming from Amherst, it not only speaks to our values and our neighbor, but UMass is you know, a major economic engine. So it's sort of a value around education and a value around accessing that, but also recognition of the economic benefit. Um, and the third one is a little, maybe is a little bit surprising. I'm thinking about the Committee on Revenue, because if we're talking about a progressive tax, I think we need more progressives on the Revenue Committee. And I know a little bit about raising revenue from a nonprofit perspective. I'm not afraid to look at budgets, and I'm not afraid to think about raising money and making a case for raising money. Um, and so I'd be looking at that. And on the um, House Committee side, if I had my choice of a fourth one, I'd probably pick ethics, because I think that would be a very fascinating committee. I'd meet different representatives than I would meet on the other committees. And the whole idea is to build coalitions, meet people, learn about what motivates them, find those shared moments so you can build a relationship. And so that would seem to sort of even it out. Thank you. My top choices for committees would be the Joint Committee on Education and the Joint Committee on Public Higher Education. Uh, I think we're backsliding in terms of our commitment to public education. Uh, I strongly believe that we need to fully fund our public school districts. We need to end uh, local school district payments to charter schools and move that to a state line item, uh, which will not only free up uh, our uh, schools to be able to invest more, but it'll also reduce the pressure on our property taxpayers and municipal budgets on a public on a higher education. Uh, I think we need to move to debt-free public colleges and universities. Uh, and the way to do that is to move back to something that was being uh, done a couple of years ago, which is the so-called 50-50 plan, where uh, the legislature pays 50% of the cost of the uh, cost of education for a student in exchange for freezing uh, tuition and fees or increases at uh, UMass in particular. Uh, so I'd like to do I'd like to start there, um, but honestly, I think it's going to in order to fully fund our schools in order to really have a progressive education reform movement, it's gonna take a real movement, a real organi organized effort to do so. So those are the two committees I'm most interested in. Uh, I also uh, am committed to continuing work on climate change. And so whether that means being on the House Climate Change Committee or the House uh, the Climate Change Caucus, uh, I think we have an opportunity to not only expand and green our commonwealth, but also do it in a way in which we can uh, rebuild our infrastructure and transportation. Not investing in transportation for properly for 20 or 30 years means we can now do it in the greenest way possible. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to move on to the uh, second round of questions. And I'm going to take a moment here to pause and say that if you have uh, questions generated from yourselves, Stephanie here in the back will be 
coming around to collect them. So if you have an index card, if you want to hold that up right now, take the opportunity to do that, Stephanie will come around and grab those as we head into the next round. Great. A couple questions coming up. That's great. Fantastic. All right. So um, now we're going to move on to the lightning hot topic round, <laughs> where each candidate will spin the wheel, this wheel, and have 60 seconds to talk about whatever category it lands on. We're going to do this three times. If the candidate gets the same topic as they did earlier, they can spin again for a new topic. Candidates, you can talk about whatever thoughts these topics bring up for you. The categories are <coughs> committee chair, first choice, as in, what would be your first choice if you, uh, if you were elected and were a committee chair? Next category is health equity, EPA rollbacks, favorite summer meal to make or eat, theme song, as in, what is your theme song? <laughs> Transgender rights ballot question, school nutrition and meals, local farms, paid leave, college student hunger, transportation, and Charlie Baker. <laughs> We're going to be starting with whichever candidate went to start the first round. Oh, that's me. So that was Eric. So we're going to go there. One of them, and then she goes, right? Yep. Yeah, we do one spin, and then we'll we'll go we'll switch. Okay. And there, there they are. Okay. And there's a little broccoli that says vote on here. So it's broccoli. Broccoli. Oh, broccoli vote. Yeah. So the the question is about. Uh, paid leave, and uh, as, as people hopefully know, um, paid family medical leave was, was passed this summer uh, by the legislature, as part of something we talked about earlier, this so-called grand bargain. Uh, the great thing about it is, I remember when I was looking into this thing, trying to figure out uh, how it was going to work, is that it was actually uh, funded through a payroll tax. So it's not something that's being left up to the employers to do, but um, because of that, a lot like uh, un unemployment insurance, or workers' compensation, the level isn't really high enough. Um, so I think it's something that needs to be brought up to a real proper, uh, you know, sufficiency wage, similar to what somebody's losing when they're off. So I think that's critically important to do. That probably is a minute, right? Yeah. Okay. You have Thank you. Seconds. I do. You do. So I think it's really important to do that. <laughs> <laughs> the thing I just said, I think, is important. <laughs> All right. Up next is Mindy. Oh, Right, Mindy's going to spin that wheel. No whammies. <laughs> paid leave. I'm a big believer in paid medical and family leave for several reasons. First of all, when folks, um, particularly low-income folks, often risk losing their jobs when their kids are sick if they didn't have paid medical leave. Their, their employer says, if you don't come to work today, don't bother coming back. And so when their kids have been sick, they've lost work. So paid medical leave is one way to keep people engaged in the workforce and allow them to continue to earn their money. And I'm glad we have it. I'd like to raise it. And I'm also looking forward to raising that minimum wage for the groups that were excluded because how do we say that child care workers shouldn't get $15, but other people can? Thank you. Thank you. All right, Eric's up next for a okay, So I got to spin it just hard enough or soft enough that we don't get paid. Right. <laughs> Uh, looks like transportation. Looks like transportation. Okay. Um, well, this is this is honestly one of the most important topics we have to deal with. Uh, public transit is chronically underfunded in our region, which is why we see fare increases and cutbacks on routes. And I think we should be expanding routes as well as also designing complete streets, uh, expanding the availability and utilization of bicycles as well as um, walkable neighborhoods, pedestrian-friendly neighborhoods. And really, this is soup to nuts. It's all the way from walkable neighborhoods straight up to having high-speed rail to Boston, uh, really good rail between here and uh, New York, and it's just through our area, from Greenfield down to Springfield. Um, if you have an appropriate public transportation system or transportation system, you can uh, make it so that people can get to their appointments, they can get to work, they can live their lives. And the funniest thing about this, hopefully all of you get a chance to travel a little bit, but uh, my family in Japan and have gotten there a bunch, 
And uh, believe it or not, other countries that are not on Mars actually have transportation systems where you can do this, and they're done reasonably affordably. We can do it here. We must do it here. Gender rights ballot question. So I don't know if everyone knows there is a ballot question on the November um, election, question three, which would seek to protect transgender rights in Massachusetts. A couple of years ago, when there was a whole bathroom situation in the Carolinas, Massachusetts passed a law, one of the first laws in the, in the country, to protect transgender rights in our state. Then folks got some folks got a little bit upset about. It. They put this referendum on. This is our opportunity to say back off. We're protecting our transgender family members, friends, and neighbors. And the way we do that is we vote yes on three. So our race is over on September fourth, which means on September fifth, both of us will be free to, in fact, you know, kind of knock on doors just for question three. So hopefully you'll join the effort too and tell your friends, neighbors, colleagues, and coworkers who live across the state about it, but especially from this area, we need to get out the vote, because when it comes to statewide races, Western Massachusetts voters matter. We're very engaged, we vote in large numbers, and we can make the difference on this question. Vote yes on three. This is your last question. Last, last spin. It sounds very um, nostalgic or something. <laughs> Okay, got paid to leave before. Health, e health equity. Well, I think we talked a little bit. By the way, I completely agree with what you said, and I really like. No, no, I'm serious. No, but I like the way you said that because you said both of us can knock doors um, after September fourth. I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to because this is really important. I mean, that that is a really really important issue, and one of the things also that um, is really critical about it is. Our area, it's a, statewide, it's a statewide ballot initiative, which means if we overperform, so to speak, and have more people turn out and vote, and vote yes, that means we can help negate votes in communities for folks who are in the way. So on health equity, um, I, I, sorry, no, it's really important, though. It's really important. Um, on health equity, I think, for one thing, we need to support community health centers like the one we have right here, uh, especially places where you, where you have integrative transportation, it's in a downtown, we have a location to be able to get to it. I think it's absolutely critically important. I also think we need to do everything we can uh, to improve uh, access in general to health services, including behavioral health, as well as also support. Um, I'll stop. Other, other good things. School nutrition and meals. So Amherst has a new program for food service that I think has been in effect for a year, but I'm, I'm sure Eric knows a little you know, more about when they started in the school system, which is a great program because it uses local produce in those meals. And that's what we need to do. We need to look throughout the state to try to support local school districts to use local produce in their, in their meal preparation. I also want to say, although we do have summer meals in Amherst, it's not as um, widespread as it should be. It's not as, um, it, it doesn't last the entire summer. There are other communities in Western Massachusetts that have a lot more sites than Amherst. We could do probably a better job of making sure that summer meals were available for kids um, in the Amherst Survival Center. We have a special program at the center where families who are using the food pantry, if they have school-age kids in months that have a school vacation, including the summer, they get extra food. And often pantries do try to have those special programs in the summer particularly, because of course hunger does not take a vacation. Thank you. All right, thank you. So that concludes the hot topic round uh, in spinning the wheel. We are now going to be moving on to round three. Um, so round three, uh, like the first round, each candidate will answer seven questions and have 90 seconds to answer. Answering the first question will be whichever candidate went last to start the second round. Mindy, so Mindy, you're going first. All right, so we are uh, gonna read these questions here from the audience. <coughs> Um, with the federal government threatening the SNAP program, how do you think states should respond? 
Can we extend the farm to school and farm to community incentives? Yes, I think we should be doing it. I also think that the state needs to be taking a more active role in lobbying against those changes. So um, too bad I didn't get the Charlie Baker on the wheel because in this case, I think it's really important for the state to be a partner of our congressional delegation. Um, Congressman McGovern is waging an incredible battle against these limitations on SNAP. We need to have his back. And in Massachusetts, we need to be prepared for what's going to happen if those cuts come through. What will it mean in terms of actual dollars? Can we make up the difference for folks? We already know that people, most people who are eligible for SNAP aren't even getting SNAP. So when we start to see those numbers drop, that means hunger is getting exacerbated in the Commonwealth. We are a common wealth. We have to make, we have to do better. And we have to look for ways to close those funding gaps, not just with these programs, but with HIP, um, which we talked about earlier, as well as looking for more um, strategic partnerships with farmers across the state to think about other ways for us to be closing that gap. We cannot let those limitations go with Massachusetts not saying anything. We need to make sure that we're lobbying and that we're firmly behind Congressman McGovern. Thank you. So this is, I mean, I hope everyone's been following this. I mean, this is a mean-spirited, asinine bill coming out of uh, the Congress. I mean, we're talking to Congressman McGovern the other day, he said the, the Senate has been generally better, but the House bill is, is extremely mean-spirited, and really also based on um, a lot of the kind of pejorative prejudices people have had around folks who uh, need help, temporary or otherwise. 70% uh, of people on food stamps, SNAP, in uh, Massachusetts are working. So the idea that you would set some program up that says that uh, you know, you're, gonna, you're gonna restrict based on uh, some sort of work requirements is based on a fallacy, but it's also the kind of thing that's intended to demonize um, people who um, need assistance. And I, we have, so one, we have to do everything we can to fight what's happening uh, in Congress and bring our voice to that game and really oppose it vigorously. Uh, and support our delegation in doing so. The second thing we have to do is we do have to be prepared to step in with, uh, with funding, supplemental funding, during the middle of the year as well as otherwise for the whole range of programs that support uh, food insecurity in the Commonwealth. Uh, there's no question about it that we need to do that. But I also do think that um, f fighting back against this right-wing philosophy is part of it. People who've heard me talk have heard me say before that I'm, I actually uh, oppose this 30 years of neoliberal trickle-down policies, and I think I think speaking out against the sort of the message behind this is as important as also stopping the programs themselves. All right, on to the second uh, question from the audience. Several several years ago, the Massachusetts legislature banned the sale of soda french fries, and other sugary or high-fat foods from being sold in public schools. Have children gotten healthier as a result? Uh, no, I mean, I think there's, there, I don't think, the, this, the, our state is, if you look nationally, it kind of depends what you're comparing it to. If you look at nationally, um, our state tends to generally be on the healthier end compared to some states, but, um, there still is a, a chronic problem around not only nutrition uh, for children and health, but also in terms of activity. And one of the things that um, we need to do is we need to uh, re-mandate recess and active play and time. That's something about supporting schools too, is that we need to have support uh, uh, physical education uh, as a part of the curriculum. And we also should, I think, stop uh, having after-school extracurriculars like athletics be uh, something that's uh, essentially means-tested. Even though you can get waivers for these things, increasingly these things become sort of elite goods. And I think what we really need to do is we need to promote active and healthy lifestyles in general um, at every age. And I think that's really important. It's also a critical part of what we did do and our food service program about bringing, we have local gardens, people will know this, our elementary schools have gardens where kids will grow food. Um, but as our food service program, we are working with local farms to bring in foods and create better food education and awareness around healthy eating um, for kids, and I think that's really important. Excuse me. 
So um, I'm not sure if Massachusetts kids are healthier right now as a result of the ban that were put in schools. I know that when Michelle Obama left the White House, America's kids were healthier um, from some of the um, efforts that she made in terms of trying to get uh, have kids eat healthier both in school and also learn about how to grow food as a way to be more interested in eating produce. I do think that there's a nutritional disparity that's happening in our in the Commonwealth and in the country, and it has to do with people's information and, and access to information around what is nutritious and what's not nutritious, and those kind of programs need to happen in schools. This is what I was saying earlier about um, school meals. If we, public school is a great democratizer in terms of making sure that every student has access to not only information, <coughs> skills, and resources, but in this case, to fresh produce and healthy food. And we have to make sure that that happens in our schools so that kids can have access to it in conjunction with information. I want to take a couple of seconds in this one to talk about SNAP, because we, the problem with this format for me is I want to keep talking about issues. I want to point out to everybody that SNAP is a great economic engine. For every dollar that's spent in SNAP, a dollar seventy comes back to the community in terms of sales to retail. What can we do about it in terms of having Congressman McGovern's back besides thanking him? We live in an area that a lot of people have family members and friends who live outside of this area who don't have such great members of Congress. We need to contact those folks that we know in other parts of the country and tell them <coughs> they need to contact their elected officials and get them to protect SNAP. Moving on to question three from the audience. Uh, both Amherst and Northampton have banned single-use plastic bags. This is a food security issue because plastic bags <coughs> and other plastic litter endanger ecosystems and, in turn, food sources. But many people have pushed back against these bans. What is your position on this type of issue, uh, for example, uh, legislation at the state level, and how would you communicate with and educate the public about this type of legislation? I'm in favor of these bans because not only the environmental impact, but there is a, there's a caveat to that, which is a lot of folks don't have the money to go and buy tote bags or reusable bags. So how do we make those available? There is a great organization in our region that is working on this, and they're called the Bag Share Project, and they make reusable bags with organizations. The Amherst Survival Center is a partner in this effort. I believe Not Bread Alone was a partner in this effort, and several food pantries across Western Massachusetts. We invite them into the center. They bring malt bags. We have grommets and grommet making machines and volunteers. We take those malt bags, literally malt bags, kind of fold it up with a template, use grommets, and there's a reusable bag. And then we're able to give those to folks who otherwise would not be able to afford to buy a tote bag. And it's an important way to make sure not only that we're being environmentally sound, protecting our ecosystems, but also we're able to reuse something that otherwise would go into the landfill. One of the most uh, shocking things that I think everyone has become more and more aware of and sensitized to uh, over the last few years is the way in which plastic uh, that's disposed of gets into our waterways, gets into um, the the feed system, the, the, the food cycle of, of animals. And you can see it when you, you know, fish or birds will wash up dead on the shore and you'll find out that they have all sorts of plastic that they've choked on. The reality is we've got to get uh, these products, this waste, these bags um, out of uh, the ecological cycle. And the way to do that is to stop using them. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of doing so. Uh, I also think that uh, anything we can do to try to expand access to uh, recyclable bags uh, is a good idea to do, and so I'd support that. Great. Thank you. Um, on to the next question. I'm shocked that this one came up here tonight, but um, what is your position on ranked choice voting? <laughs> um, I'm in favor of ranked choice voting. I think, I think it's... The, uh, I'm in favor of it. I think, it, I think it's quite simply, uh, it's a good idea on many levels, but I think one of the things it allows you to do is it allows um, for really robust uh, debate around issues and choices. It, it removes 
uh, sort of the isolation, the what people probably call the Nader effect or the Green Party effect of saying that if you have somebody running, um, you're throwing away your vote or you can't uh, express your values or beliefs. Uh, you know, I think it's a good idea um, for that reason. And so, I, and I think it's and essentially it's more democratic. I mean, I hope people know what it is, right? Like you have a couple few people running on a ballot and you can put in your first and second choices and then if nobody gets past the post 50% initially, then they start adding in the other, the other uh, votes until somebody gets over 50% with their second and third choices. Um, so I'm, I'm in favor of it. I would uh, support moving uh, this legislatively on Big Hill. I support it also because I think it gives voters sort of more, um, their vote counts, you know, and, and counts in a different way and in a more important way. And I also support other voting reforms that are being discussed on the state level, um, all of which are, get, are designed to increase voter turnout and increase voter engagement. So I would support no excuse absentee voting. I don't think we should have to be interrogated when we want an absentee ballot as to why we need it. I think we should just be able to get it and vote absentee. Um, I also want same day registration. I want to assess what that means for town clerks and what sort of needs they have to be able to implement that. I think the 20 day in advance deadline is harsh and it blocks out people and it disenfranchises people. And you can see in an area like Amherst where people may be moving into the area in the later part of August, very close to the election, they won't even be able to register for the primary. And I also want us to look at um, weekend voting and not just Tuesday voting. Um, this year, as you may know, the election is the Tuesday after Labor Day, which is a very bad day for an election because it feels like Monday, not a Tuesday. And people will know that. People will be distracted because of the holiday. But I'm also concerned because it means that absentee ballots will not be available the day before as they usually are. So if people discover that they're not going to be in town on election day. They won't have Monday to get their absentee ballot. If they haven't figured it out by Friday, they won't have it. And to me, that's unnecessarily blocking people from voting. We should be encouraging um, people to participate in the process at all levels, including voting. Great, thank you. Uh, this next question is, uh, you both have had work experience in Western Massachusetts in years past. Eric in extending broadband in, to rural communities, Mindy in working with HIV AIDS. Please tell us how you now evaluate the success of those experiences. I go first. Um, well, I feel um, that the, so when I first moved to Western Massachusetts, which was in the late 1980s, I was the regional coordinator for HIV testing and counseling for the Department of Public Health in Massachusetts. And at that time, in 1987, out here, there were some people who were finding out that they were um, infected with HIV, but there weren't a whole lot of services to offer people once they found out that information. So in addition to doing counseling and overseeing the counseling that was happening in the four counties, we had to get involved in developing services because as counselors were giving the information to people, the patients were saying, so what do I do? Where do I go? Is there support here for me? Is there a doctor who can take care of me? Um, is there housing for me? And so we started to develop a network of services that, for the most part, still exist today. Um, AIDS Care in Hampshire County was started as a result of that. The Berkshire American Red Cross started programs as a result of that. Even UMass Health Services got involved. Things have changed in the world of HIV medicine and treatment, though, in the past 20, 25, maybe 30 years. Um, and so some of those programs no longer exist, but they set the foundation for people to come together where both activists, physicians, hospital <coughs> administrators, counselors, drug and alcohol treatment providers, licensed mental health counselors, acupuncturists, everybody could come to the table and say, so what pieces of this pie are we going to split up? And then how are we gonna make sure that people know about it? So I feel really good about that process and I think it set up HIV services for the, for, for the initial one to two decades following that? So I've done a lot of work actually in the region um, over the years and uh, just to give you a little bit of background on it, when I was working for Governor Patrick as Assistant Secretary, my job was to help try to extend participation in the innovation economy um, throughout uh, the state. So I did some work up in Lowell Lawrence, I did some work down in uh, New Bedford and in uh, Metro West and the Worcester area, but I also did an awful lot of work in the Pioneer Valley. 
So I'm really pleased. If you saw an article recently in the Gazette about a precision manufacturing training program uh, that connects the Franklin Hampshire Labor Camp, uh, uh, Workforce Board and uh, Greenfield Community College and Franklin Technical uh, School uh, to, get, to help train unemployed or underemployed people in manufacturing jobs, that was one of the things that we worked on uh, getting an investment into. Uh, down in Holyoke, there's a new culinary school uh, that is offering career pathways for people. Uh, it's located down in the flats, right in, the, right in a neighborhood where there are lots of folks who can benefit from it. Uh, and that was actually the last investment that I worked on as part of the Patrick administration. Uh, I've also worked on uh, uh, the Life Sciences Building, $95 million building up at UMass, where uh, we worked on a plan with the university uh, to integrate the available services and expertise of the faculty uh, with area companies, both <coughs> manufacturers and others um, who are in central Massachusetts and western Mass to try to help them be more competitive. Because a lot of them, if they could get a little bit of assistance in figuring out and process improvements, could expand their competitiveness. Um, so that's, <coughs> I, I mean, I, I feel uh, great about it and also wonderful about the relationships I have up and down the valley that I can bring to bear as, as the representative. Great, thank you. Um, the next, this next question is, um, what have you done in your personal life to counteract the Trump administration and the permission the president has seemed to give to a full-throated expression of racism in the United States? Well, uh, personally, um, I have uh, taken on um, a lot of work around undocumented immigrants. Uh, this this year, it's something that, um, as a son of an immigrant, as somebody who is a person of color, I uh, feel keenly the sense of isolation that you can have uh, in our society writ large, even in the absence of there being almost a full scale uh, war on uh, demonizing uh, immigrants in our country, and uh, and so I've. Um, I don't want to talk about it, but I've been active. I've been active doing various things in our community, uh, whether in sanctuary or elsewhere, to try to support communities and, and be supported wherever I can. It's important. It's incredibly important. Um, about a month or so after Trump got elected, there was this big um, forum. I don't know if other folks were there in Northampton. Actually, Congressman Levin was there, um, and about 800 people came together sort of feeling not just um, sad and desolate, but wanting to do something. And several things happened as a result of that meeting. Some groups were formed, and Indivisible in Northampton was formed. But there was another group that was formed called 413 Staying Connected, which I'm part of, which actually just seeks to make sure that the community is, is aware of not only what the Trump administration is doing, but events and activism that can accompany that. And that's on a range of issues, including um, on racism and anti immigrant issues, as well as you know, things like what the administration is doing in the EPA. And so one of the things that I've taken on with that is um, the social media piece. And it, a big piece of that social media is making sure that people know about um, what's happening and also what we can do about it in terms of plugging into not only local organizations and local protests, whether it's family separation rallies in Springfield or um, other kinds of uh, rallies that are happening, but also what organizations on a local and federal level and a national level um, are providing that kind of resource and support. And so one of the ways that I've sort of channeled my personal piece is through that. The other way is um, I like to think in, in elections I do sometimes fantasy in Congress, you know, what I think about so who are the members of Congress that I really like to be in Congress, and I try to think about if I can afford donations to a couple of them. And I've done sort of the same kind of thing in terms of fighting back Trump, because I look at for all of the organizations that I want to make sure that I'm supporting, and I do that. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so here is the last question for the audience round. Yeah, we're going to have uh, time for a couple more. And we're going to have time for a couple more. <laughs> so stay tuned. Uh, yeah. What endorsement are you most proud of, and why? Um, well, my kids endorsed me, so I'm kind of proud of that. <laughs> but um, um, I think I'm uh, most proud 
of uh, the Daily Hampshire Gazette endorsement. Um, and I think it's because that endorsement really spoke, really captured what I think I bring that's different. And I know that Eric and I struggle with this in terms of this question that I always get, and I think we always get it because we get it when we're together in interviews, about well, how are you different? And so on positions, we're often not that different, but I felt that that endorsement underscored what I feel that I bring to the race that is different. And so it helped me tell my story um, to voters in a way that I benefit from and that um, I appreciate greatly. So the number one thing that I'm, I'm most uh, proud of in terms of endorsements and most moved by is uh, all the people I meet while I'm knocking doors. I mean, the folks who I meet going door to door, listen to, engage with, and uh, am always tickled and pleased when they're supporting me. Because it's one of those things where it's a bizarre business where you, you lay yourself out and you hope you can work with people and help them and uh, bring your best self to the work. Um, but uh, there's also extraordinarily humbling because you're talking about taking on a responsibility that's really profound. So that's, that's honestly, sincerely, that's, we've been at it for so many months now and met so many people that that's really the deepest and most moving part. Really, it's my hometown. So, and I've went to UMass and I've worked in town too. So it means an awful lot to me. The, the endorsement of the AFL-CIO and, and particularly the Service Employees Union, uh, International Union 509, uh, and other unions, a bunch of them have endorsed me, uh, mean a lot to me because many times these are folks who know the work I've done on Beacon Hill. Um, they, I've met them and they know the work I've done and the passion I bring. I tend to be kind of buttoned down like my collar, so my demeanor also sometimes seems a little dry, but the reality is I have a deeply felt passion for the work that I do, what I care about around social justice, community development, and really trying to make government work more effectively for each one of you. And those unions that are supporting me uh, know what I can do to bring my, my experience and my passion uh, and my common sense, which hopefully I've shown in the school committee a little bit, uh, to, to Beacon Hill. That's what I want to do. Um, these a uh, couple questions that get in under the wire. Uh, do you support teaching students to cook and learn about food? Uh, uh, Amherst High School Committee eliminated these food classes. So, so do you support uh, teaching students to cook and learn about food, preparing food, and how would you do that? Uh, so first, uh, I su one of the reasons why I talk about the need to fully fund our schools, and one of the reasons why I mentioned even more controversially earlier, uh, ending local school district funding for charter schools, is because we don't have enough money. Uh, Three million dollars a year, around a million and a half at the regional level, a million and a half at the elementary school district, uh, goes out of our coffers to fund area charter schools. And this past year, because we had a um, healthcare crisis, uh, healthcare insurance premium crisis, excuse me, the, the health trust, uh, we had to cut another million dollars out of our regional school budget, and another half a million dollars out of our elementary school, in our elementary school budget. Uh, I can't think of anyone on the school committee who wanted to cut our culinary program. Uh, so uh, I support bringing it back, but that's, I, the reason I'm saying this though is because there's a serious urgency about this, right? Like we can talk about what we believe in and talk about what we want, but the reality is that we don't really move on changing our funding for public education and investing in our schools, our public schools. And if we don't move on progressive taxation over the next two sessions, we're not going to have the money, and what's going to happen is increasingly our local school districts are going to be squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. There's an urgency to this. And, that's, and, if we, and my point is, if we have it, then I would be the first person to promote uh, reopening the culinary program at the high school, among other things that we need to do. I support teaching um, children and adults how to cook and about food. Um, I've been uh, instrumental in sort of establishing healthy cooking classes at the Emerson Survival Center that happen on a quarterly basis as a way to get people learn how to prepare all sorts of fresh produce, especially zucchini this time of year, and all the ways that we can eat it. Um, and I think that you know, learning about food and learning about fresh produce is the best way to be able to eat it and to be able to enjoy it and to be healthy from it. 
Um, and I, and I, as a taxpayer and a resident in Amherst, as well as a candidate, I'm also in favor of stopping the way that we fund charter schools because these are the kinds of programs that actually end up being on the um, cutting board, so to speak, um, for when, the, when charter school funding leaves a budget. Because once we start depleting those coffers, then it's programs like arts, music, cooking, all these programs that are looked at as secondary that end up having to be shaved. And then families whose kids may be really engaged with school through those programs feel, well, this isn't for me. They end up going out of the district to a charter school to get a death spiral for public education. It has to stop. Not only does it have to stop because of it's, there's no accountability, it has to stop because these are the programs that our kids should be able to have in their public high school. They should be able to learn about nutrition. They should be able to learn about how to cook. So yes, I support it, and I support it in school, but I also support it out of school. So I would also support grants to community-based organizations that do it on an after-school basis. Thank you. Um, the last question here is, how would you better integrate the community with the area colleges? So we all know it play a large role in our region. Are we answering this question to feed your new job so yeah. you can go and <laughs> carry it on? Um, well, you know, my experience with how the community and community-based organizations integrate with the colleges is kind of unique given my position at the Amherst Survival Center. Only because from that perch, we see college students coming to really volunteer to the community and to be able to give back to the community. And we see that on a regular basis as a community. We see college students doing that, whether it's Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Daffodil Run, which is all basically run by college students, or food drives, or turkey drives at Thanksgiving. Um, so I see that integration in terms of students and organizations. I'm not sure if the question was specifically about students, but I also feel that the university is doing, um, um, starting to do a really good job of engaging with the community around potentially controversial issues and discussing them. Um, last year, I went to several forums on food insecurity on that college campus that, this, that the university um, held. And so that kind of integration works. I have to say that I also see it with the private colleges, though, um, where they are um, sort of looking to support the community and support community-based organizations using their resources. Could we do better? Absolutely. And I'm looking forward to playing a role in making that happen. So the, uh, the area universities, uh, colleges and universities, have done, uh, I think, a wonderful job with service learning opportunities um, for many, many years. So if you go really almost any community in the area, you'll see that there are public health studies going on. There's work going on in our schools. Uh, there's, you know, the university does a lot um, with students and with uh, student class projects and things like that. I think the area when, when uh, I was working for Governor Patrick and we were trying to do integrative regional economic development strategies and community development strategies, we were trying to engage all the people in the community and really leverage all the resources we have. One of the things that we found though is that uh, the colleges and universities didn't always know how they could align what they were doing effectively with what community organizations or municipalities wanted to do. And so what we started to do was um, put teams together uh, across different agencies, across different regions, to try to identify both what the needs were as well as also how we could align the, uh, the basic mission of an organization um, with a particular community. We did that particularly successfully, I think, in Holyoke again, as well as in Springfield to some extent, where there's now a UMass uh, Springfield Center. Usually, uh, money helps drive things. So I hate, I hate to say, almost everywhere we went were we were successful. Even a little bit of seed money on the table would incent collaboration and creativity in a way uh, that the absence of that, people would be left to go to their, uh, their own corners and figure out what they were gonna do. So I would love to continue that work, both here in uh, Amherst, in, in Pelham and Granby, but also regionally collaborating with the legislators and thinking how we could bring resources to bear to try to set collaboration that would engage the college and university uh, holistically in our communities better. Great, thank you. Um, so now we're gonna move on to final remarks. Um, each candidate will have one minute to make closing remarks. And... Uh, 
Um, so, um, so I don't know who, who goes first for this one. Well, I, I went Eric. first at the beginning. Okay. So, would that who would go? Well, I think that means it's Mindy's choice, though, isn't it? Sure, your choice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really, I really appreciate again the uh, food bank uh, for organizing this forum. Uh, CISA, Keith, everyone, for all of you being here. As I've, as I've said before, and hopefully, I don't know how many, I, I, looking around the room, I know a number of people who I've had a chance to be and speak with during the campaign. We have two weeks to go, and we're gonna be out there, I'm gonna be out there personally knocking doors every single day. Uh, if I hadn't had a chance to speak with you yet, I hope I do get a chance to, to hear what you're thinking, to get your thoughts, to answer your questions, this is really one of the deepest honors a person can have. As hard as it is, it is um, enriching in a way that I could hardly describe. The only thing I think that would be more enriching for me would be to win, because I think the needs of our community, I know it's funny, but the needs of our community, and the needs of our region uh, are so profound that um, I'm really, I'm, I'm energized to go to Beacon Hill and significantly move the needle on things that I'm talking about, like public education, public higher education, transportation, climate change. I want to be your advocate, and I want to be your partner in doing it, and I look forward to having your vote. Thank you. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about this notion of what is a safety net. Um, because tonight's, I think, theme was around food justice and health equity, and oftentimes it's talked about as safety net services. And I wanna challenge us to think differently about that. I want us to envision that a safety net usually means that there's a tightrope from point A to point B, and somebody is walking that tightrope all by themselves. And there are unexpected circumstances that can happen that can make them lose their balance, and they fall. And the safety net is there to break the fall. I want us to reimagine that some of the services that we think right now are safety net services should be available to people without them having to fall. That if we believe that, in fact, accessing health care, food, education, housing, a good job, at good wages, and a safe retirement are human rights, then someone should not have to fall in order to have access to the services that allow them to live with dignity. And the reason why I'm pointing it out in this particular debate is because, and forum is because we're talking about safety net services. And I'd like us to move forward from this place and think about so how can we, in fact, close that gap and allow people not to be alone on that tightrope, not to feel like they fail, and then not to feel embarrassed because they need those services. Thank you. I hope I can earn your vote on September 4th. Thank you. Um, so that concludes our discussion for this evening. Uh, Laura from the Food Bank will be coming up with a few closing remarks. I just want to, th uh, again, thank, uh, take this moment to thank the Bank's Community Center, the Food Bank of Western Mass for pulling this together, Eric Nakajima and Mindy Dome, candidates here for state rep um, as we move forward to, towards that primary vote on Tuesday the 4th, the day after Labor Day. Um, and it's an, exciting, it's an exciting time for Western Mass politics, on, uh, especially on the state level, acutely right now. So I, I'm, I'm glad to see everybody here engaged and active, and uh, I, I hope you'll all be heading to the polls on, on the 4th. Uh, thank you. So I'll turn it over to Laura. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Keith, and thank you, Eric and Mindy, so much for being here. Uh, those the, your answers were very nuanced, deeply thought. Uh, clearly, clearly, you both have a wealth of experience, and I think no matter who wins this election, the district will be in really good hands. So let's can we have a round of applause? For everybody for coming out tonight and participating in democracy. Uh, this, uh, this is what we have as a democracy. It does not work without our participation. Um, thank you so much, Keith, for moderating. Um, thank you to CISA for co-sponsoring, to the Bain Center, and uh, to my colleagues uh, at the Food Bank for helping tonight. So we have two more forums coming up. Um, we've done six altogether. This is the fourth. Uh, I know you all live in this district, but if you're interested in, in races outside of the district, the next one is this coming Wednesday night, the 22nd, um, for the second Hampshire uh, seat. This is the one that Rep Seibach currently holds. He's retiring, so there's three candidates vying for that seat. Marie McCourt, uh, Dan Carey, and John Hine, and that's going to be at the South Hadley Public Library, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m., again, this Wednesday, the 22nd. 
And then the one after that is the Hamden Senate Forum. This is the seat currently held by uh, Senator James Welch, who is the incumbent, and he's being challenged by Ahmad Rivera. This uh, forum is going to be Wednesday, August 29th, from 6 to 7 p.m. at Focus Springfield Community Television in Springfield. Um, there are very limited seats for that, so you have to call the League of Women Voters in Springfield and make a reservation if you're interested. But it's also going to be streamed on Facebook and on the Springfield uh, TV forum, and I'm sure it will be online as well. So thank you again for, for coming out, and remember, vote on September 4th.